Welcome to episode 13, our lucky episode. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you. Uh, Thanksgiving is really an important day in our family. Uh, we start the day with kind of a fun little thing. It's our athletic event called the 5th K, Thanksgiving 5th K. Uh, everyone meets at the house at about 9, and then we walk over to my brother-in-law Craig's house, about two-mile walk. And while we walk there, we drink fifths of alcohol, so that's why it's called the 5th K. Uh, we have sweatshirts that say Thanksgiving 5th K on them, and this year, uh, Lindsay added, if you don't booze, you lose, which I thought's hilarious. And then we all come back here, about 30 to 40 people come back to my home here, and uh, we have, uh, I'll be cooking two turkeys this year. I'll cook uh, one tomorrow and then I'll cook one on Thanksgiving day. So we'll have, uh, I'll probably have the turkey soup ready. I'll have plenty of gravy, I'll have plenty of, uh, plenty of food, uh, plenty of vegetables. Uh, I've always liked Thanksgiving. Uh, really one of the last times I was ever with my family, my whole family before, you know, people started to die was the Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving, 1974. That morning, I played my last high school football game, and I've had a few bad Thanksgivings because of life, and uh, one of my goals is to make sure, if I can, that everyone I know has a great Thanksgiving. So I'm hoping you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, too. Well, let's get into this week's questions. Um, boy, I got to tell you, a, a lot of them are, you readers are doing a great job, uh, you listeners, and the, the questions are now coming in uh, bigger and brighter and better than ever. And, and I appreciate that, uh, <clears throat> except for the idea that I have to read so much more, but that's fine. So this comes from uh, Pete, and Pete says, I've been very active over the last 10 years with different phases of marathon training, cycling, strength training, kettlebell training, obstacle course racing. Over the last year or more, I've been alternating daily between strength training and endurance training very consistently, uh, consistently, I'm sorry, making sure not to overtrain, obviously. One of my goals for next year is a 56-kilometer trail race. I'd like to be somewhat competitive for my age group. How much would you recommend I cut back on strength training? And is there specific lifts or exercises that would help me stay healthy and strong while running so much? I'm 40 years old, and this is the important part, this last little bit, Pete. Five foot nine, 162. Um, listen, I... I would never question anybody on body mass, but for a 56k uh, kilometer trail race, 162. And I'm not. And don't take this wrong or right. I don't have a picture of you, but um, I, my senior in high school, I weighed 163 when I was a discus thrower. Um, Peter Schnell, who's a good friend of mine, uh, got three gold medals at the Olympics in '64 and and before. Um, he was a big, strong guy too, and. When, when I was with him one time, we were talking about that. And, you know, in his tradition, it was he was a he was more of a sprint, a, a sprint middle distance runner versus, you know, uh, someone who he liked to make people really he liked to really push it. So he was a bigger guy, too. Um, my concern is if you get into too much strength training, that number 162 might be might go up a little bit. And I've got to say that would be counterproductive to what you want. So use. I would say, you know, I don't know if you're doing a hinge, like a deadlift or something like that, but any kind of hinge, and a deadlift is probably the best one for you, and I, I would imagine a hinge, because this comes from Percy Cerruti, you know, that deadlift, you know, makes you tall, makes you strong, that's going to help you somehow holding your posture at least uh, in a race. Uh, something as simple as just doing a goblet squat, not for strength, but for mobility and flexibility might be just something because I don't necessarily think you want loose joints, but you want strong and flexible joints. You want you want that what the, the in Chinese medicine they call the four knots. Uh, that's the hips and the shoulders, uh, and you want your hips and shoulders to be like shoelace knots, tight enough to stay together, loose enough that you can unpull the strings. Well, so one of the things, yeah, I think strength training will help you. But at the same time, I want you to think about uh, the four knots. Get stronger, but stay mobile and flexible. Um, a deadlift, goblet squat, any kind of, I would probably just, I think there might be value in pull-ups for you, and I think there probably value in doing uh, 
overhead vertical presses, but uh, I would just keep it, I would stay away from the hypertrophy numbers as best I can. Honestly, and if you are if you are a reader on our site, go over and review that recent article on easy strength and maybe even read some of the material on easy strength I've left up there. But clearly, I think you want to, to do more something like an easy strength program. Three to five days a week, two sets of five in the deadlift, two, you know, a total of 10 pull-ups somehow, two sets of five in, in a press, uh, ab wheel, and that's it. Just the four exercises. I wouldn't even do the additional exercise. And uh, so two sets of five, let's see, if you went deadlift, uh, deadlift, press, pull up an ab wheel, that would take you, you know, two sets of five each. It would take you eight, nine, ten minutes, and then use that goblet squat maybe in the warm-up just to loosen things up at the bottom and maybe finish off with a goblet squat or two where you're kind of loosening things up at the, bo- at, the at the end of the workout. But, yes, I think it could help you. Very much I think it could help you. Um, Joe D is one of the – a good friend of mine. He was he was big into the Spartan races. He was one of the uh, – um, administrators of Spartan races. And, you know, when you meet Joe, you know, he's a, he's a big, strong engine. And I think, I think that's what you need. I think you need not only endurance, but you need all kinds of strength to be a a trail runner. So I think it's going to help you. I thought that was a good question. Thank you, Pete. This comes from uh, Joe after running the park bench generator. uh, For those who don't know, uh, danjohnworkouts.com uh, one of the workouts, we have two kinds of workouts, a bus bench, and those are the very specific do this kind of thing, uh, uh, the big 21 program, mass made simple, that kind of thing. And then there's the park bench ones where you put in what equipment you have, your, where you're coming in at, how long you want to work out, how many days of the week, and then it spins out specific workouts for you, okay? Um, so that's what he's asking a question about. After running the park bench generator for a couple of weeks, here's my question. When selecting workout frequency, would you rather an athlete, me, <laughs> select five, five or even seven days a week, knowing that along the way life is going to make me skip workouts, or select two or three days a week, knowing for sure that I'll get those in and take additional rest, mobility, tonic days if the opportunity presents itself? Uh, postscript, loving doesn't begin to describe how I feel about the park bench generator. It's outstanding. I wish this existed when I found your stuff over a decade ago. Yeah, and I wish it existed too, but it, it, it didn't. Um, yeah, I would say select the three and do the three workouts. Um, the downside of doing seven, I think, is that I'm wondering if the generator is going to be trying to get a little too fancy for you. Yeah, just pick the three and do them. Um, I've... I've looked around, I've played around with the generator maybe a little bit too much, but uh, uh, I think I think it does its best at about three or four workouts a week. Um, and and then don't forget, Joe, play around with the exercises in in, in your um, uh, on the right there. So for example, if it says uh, air squats, but because of your 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 uh, being an athlete, that's too much. Be sure to slide it back down to something like goblet squats or something that's more fitting for your week in, week out work. Okay, so three days a week, maybe four, but uh, stick and get those done. Okay. Next question is from Larry, and Larry asked me a question. It's gonna be I have to put up with this question for about two more weeks. I'm hoping, and then it will will never it'll never raise its head again. In my career, a few things have come up. And uh, people just keep asking about it and asking about it until I just I hit I hit saturation point. Um, what do you think of Z Health? What do you think of CrossFit? What do you think of lunges? What do you think of? And, and Larry asks, in the in the last two episodes, you address the game changers. I can't quite put my finger on where you stand based on your limited comments, but I am generally curious. Can you clarify your stance on the movie? And on vegan diets for athletes. Well, I haven't seen it. And I'm not going to. Uh, I'd much rather watch uh, Disney Plus and watch The Mandalorian and uh, Star Wars. Uh, listen, if when 
this is the, this is still the problem with this kind of thing. I break I break my world into four parts. Uh, the what I do, health, longevity, fitness, and then performance. You know, health. I use Matthew Tone's definition: the optimal interplay of the human organs. You find out by blood tests, medical exams, eye exam, dental exams, and to see what your health is. And uh, health is going to be uh, an appropriate place between two extremes, usually. Longevity is a quality and quantity issue. Uh, issue In my family, we don't tend to have a lot of longevity, uh, but we have good lives. Um, the third is fitness. That's ability to do a task. And then what I work on is performance. Uh, when they call your name, when the... <laughs> When the rocket comes in, when uh, the whistle blows, you step up and perform. Okay, um, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, you, you got to be very careful when you read books like The Blue Zone. Uh, you got to be careful about reading anything, really, um, because as as we found out just a few a few years ago, Ansel Keys handpicked his his results from that famous study. Um, it is possible to live on, on practically any diet. Um, if you go and I have travel around and you meet, you know, people who were World War II and basically had nothing to eat for a few years, and they're, you know, well, it's not so much now, but a few years ago, you know, someone in their 90s who basically starved for two decades. Um, you got to be real careful uh, uh, when it comes to the next two areas: fitness and performance. Frankly, my best efforts are on <laughs> with no food in my body, uh, star in a starvation mode. Um, so I'm always concerned when someone cherry picks evidence. Uh, every single person involved in the show has a financial thumb on a vegan. Uh, Arnold, as I understand it now, uh, he is now promoting a vegan uh, uh, protein powder. Well, that should be clear right in the beginning. Um, you know, I watched that. There's a high school coach who proved that he could uh, lose weight on the all McDonald's diet. Well, he was also being paid by McDonald's. So you have to just be very careful sometimes when money is involved. Frankly, I I don't care what you eat. If, if you throw the discus 75 meters and you're a vegan or a carnivore, I don't care. You're the new world record holder. If, if you can be a vegan and not bother me constantly about what you eat, good for you. Uh, that's one of my big knocks on CrossFitters and vegans is they're always telling you with that little air of superiority about how they eat. Uh, it's much like when someone joins a new religion and all of a sudden they have the answer to all questions. Uh, that just gets difficult for me. Um, I mean, I have, I, I don't. I'm not sure humans are evolved. We're clearly omnivores, but um, you know, I'm not sure that you know, uh, uh, watching a documentary on the same place I watch How I Met Your Mother is going to change my mind on a lot of things. Um, as my daughter pointed out, be very careful about getting your information and entertainment from the same source. Um, it can cloud the issues a little bit. I've. I don't know what you wanted me to say, Larry, but uh, these aren't, you know, uh, nutrition is not exactly my 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 thing. I mean, I certainly have to have opinions on it if you're a strength coach. Yeah, you have to, or performance coach. Um, but um, I, I found I found that this particular show was divisive as anything in the pol a political s sphere in the UK or the United States that's going on right now. And the last thing we need is more divisiveness. So I don't know. Um, I just, I just don't know if I could watch another food documentary. I, I just don't know if I have the patience for it. Uh, I did enjoy the one about the guy who just did juicing for a year and lost all the weight. I, I enjoyed that one. I, I don't know why I liked it, but I found it fascinating. All right. Hey, next question is from Marco. I want to thank you for saving my life. Wow. I had a very bad car accident. And my seatbelt probably saved me. I didn't wear a seatbelt before, but when I started wearing it, when I read your book, Never Let Go, a few months ago, before. 
you know, good. Thank you. I, Marco, that makes me very happy. Um, you know, we know statistically that after 25, to make it to age 55, you just need to do two things. Don't smoke, wear your seatbelt. And uh, I'm glad you did that, Marco. Uh, really, that's, that's a blessing, and I appreciate you letting me know. I have one fitness question. I am 24, I'm 24 year old and I currently train park bench style and I really enjoy it. I also have some results. I also have some results and I feel great. I am really tired of constant grind in the gym. Your park bench style of training changed my life. Hmm. I would like to know when I should expect plateau and mix it with some bus bench program. Okay, just, just to let you know, everybody, <laughs> that the park bench generator has enough small change in it that you should be able to keep improving for a while. Generally on almost any program, the uh, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days are when things start to top out. If there's a gentle mix, like when you did the Terry and Jan Todd's program where they had four, four week cycles, you can push it out to 16. And our generator is built more like that. So you're probably looking at about, oh, probably about four months from now, you might find yourself getting a little, uh, hey, let's try something different. Um, then there'd be a number of directions to go to. You could do something like uh, a, a challenge. I, I'm a big fan of challenges or compete in something, uh, depending what you want. But there's challenges, silly challenges we do in the gym. The 10,000 swing program is a challenge that takes 20 days to go. Uh, easy strength is a 40-day challenge. It takes uh, eight weeks training five days a week. The big 21 program is a challenge. It's three weeks of lifting three times a week. Um, I love that kind of thing. And I also like it if you go compete. I don't care what it is. Because uh, once you compete, you come back into the gym, everything just seems a little clearer and better. And then finally, the follow-up questions here. Also, would you recommend me to, to learn some weightlifting? If you mean Olympic lifting, I, as you're 24, uh, there too, a little bit of information here might help. I'm a kinesiologist and physiotherapist, and I don't know weightlifting. Other colleagues told me that it is too late to learn lifts very well. Well, that's just not true. You're 24. I mean, I, I could teach you when you're 64. Uh, the the value of learning the Olympic lifts, um, and I and I've said this before when young strength coaches ask me how to become, you know, I want to get in the field. What should I do? Almost universally, I tell them, well, I want you to lift an Olympic lifting meet because what that does is teach you in true intensity, you know, uh, not three sets of eight intensity, but 500 people, three officials you and your coach backstage nervous your thumbs you know taped up maybe a little bit of blood somewhere um, chalk on your hands you know you're nervous and you know there's some but so yeah I think there's some value to it because it'll teach you you don't have to be the world champion but I would recommend you learn how to do it and once again let me just say from the bottom of my heart thank you for saying that about the uh, the seat belt and uh I would also maybe want to recommend that you learn first aid, including the Heimlich maneuver, because I'm two for two. I've saved two people at the Heimlich maneuver. So seat belts and not smoking saves your life. Let's start thinking about other people too. All right, thank you. Good question. Now we got a question from Josh. In regards to programming, if your specific program reads three sets of eight, is the reader doing any warm up sets to these exercises beforehand, besides the warm up mobility section you provide? Also, is the reader picking the same weight for the three sets or are they ascending weights as they go up? You know, the, the answer to that, Josh, is going to be weird. The answer is yes to everything you just said. Um, when I do three sets of eight, I do what you said basically both, both ways. So very often, okay, so I've done my general warm-up and the lift, for example, is overhead squats, three sets of eight with one minute rest. I don't do any warm-ups. Uh, I use that first set to warm up. It only has one minute rest in between when I'm doing it this way. Second set, get the eight reps in, put the weight down. 
And finally, the last set, still with just that one minute interval of rest, then I go boom, 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 and get the last set. Uh, personally, I think that's the best way to do it. But you can also to ramp it up. Uh, if you read my work, uh, I have a couple of I have a couple of ways I address this. One is in classical conditioning and, and uh, ten exercises, and um, I think we're going to make sure that gets put up on the site very soon. And I also have another one called the Delorme Protocol. And I'll make sure that gets up on the site too, okay? Um, and basically with that one, your first set, and in this, here's, but the problem is going to be this, Josh, straight up. You know, when I say, if I'm benching 400 for eight and I say 50%, that means I'm doing a set of 200 for eight. When I jump to 75% for eight, that's 300. And when I go to 400 for eight, with that's that's a heavy set. so yeah but if if you're pressing 40 pounds you're gonna be doing 20 for eight and now you just have to so the problem comes back to something I've, I've addressed many times and that's the whole problem with percentages and what do you mean by going up in weight Josh I think there's great value in also having logical jumps that's one of the reasons I like the kettlebells for overhead presses like, for example, just pretend with you, Josh, you're going to do the 20K, a set of eight, jump to the 24K for a set of eight. Your last set's 28K for a set of eight. To me, that's much better than 50% and 75% when you have those natural progressions. If you're using machines uh, for your presses and pulls and some of the other stuff, you probably can go right in and do three sets of eight with the same load. Or, you know, it's very simple, or do the pin selections. So very simply, both of your your options are correct. Um, maybe for you, you might want to experiment a little bit with it. Uh, for me, three sets of eight, one minute rest, same weight, for whatever reason, is my, is my perfect wheelhouse. I've done it the other ways, and I'll try to get those programs up as soon as I can. Uh, but for me, that's best for me. You might might like the other way. I think the key is that on the third set, you are finishing um, with with a high level of intensity. Okay. And then finally, ask one last question. Lastly, I would love to take any of your RKC coaches you coach. Is there a place I could go to see your full year schedule? You know, I wish there was, Josh. One of the problems we have with those events is, um, well, I don't want to be too candid, but I have to put them off for a while, and then I'll schedule another one, and then that has to get completed, and then I'll schedule another one. I used to schedule, oh, six, seven, eight in a year, and I loved it, but because of some other issues, we just can't do it that way anymore. And I do apologize for you, okay? I'm sorry. Got a question from Zachary. What body fat percentages do you believe to be ideal for everyday healthy living? How much higher or lower from that ideal do you believe is effective for increasing muscle mass or other goals? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this. That's that's not my wheelhouse, but I will quote people I do know. Um, Josh Hillis for females, he has the number of 19% as being what he calls rock star hot. Uh, he uses those pictures, uh, I don't even know where the website is anymore, but um, uh, they would they did a nice job showing what 40% body fat from female, 35, 30, 25, 20. And really for most females, they want to be probably 19, 19% body fat. Um, I, I've been told it's impossible for women to get down to, to single digit body fat, especially the lower ones without aid from other, other sources. But certainly when you, when women are about 19 and, and, and they can certainly slide up higher too than that, but in that around 19 is probably the best place. Um, last time I got body fat tested, I was at 19, made me very happy because last year I was at 30 right before my uh, total hip replacement. So I've lost 11% body fat in a year. 
which to me reminds us of how bogus body fat measurements are because there's just too many factors, but we'll just stay there. But generally for men, I would have to agree with what Art Devaney said back in 1999, that about 15% is where you'd want to be. Uh, certainly could, men can slide down naturally to single digits for a while. But, you know, so for men, 15-ish, for women, 19-ish. Um, but it's not so much where you are. I would argue this, Zachary, is it would be nice to be at a body fat percentage for a long time. So, you know, for me, holding on to 19%, I'd love to get down to 15. That is my goal, by the way. But I'd much be much happier 10 years from now have held held 19% for 10 years versus sliding down to 12, shooting back up to 35, 40, coming back down to 14, getting up to that's when I think the problems happen with the hormone system. So uh, those are those are those are pretty good ballpark numbers. Um, if you get a chance, Josh Hillis H I L L I S, uh, go go off to his blog and deep dive. It is the not only is a, he's a good writer, but he's a very entertaining person on his blog. Uh, I don't know what the blog's called anymore, but you'll find it right away. And you'll get all these interesting pictures of what, what we're talking about. Got a question from David, and David's question ties very well into what Zachary's question about body fat was. I'm 51 and have trained fairly consistently since my early 20s with a few lapses, as we all have. I've just started training my 16-year-old son, and we are on our last week of Mass Made Simple. My son has made some great gains, and I've made some modest gains, although my percentage of body fat is 20%, and I'd like to bring it down closer to 15%. I weigh just under 200, and my son is about 140 at 17% body fat. What kind of program would you recommend after we finish Mass Made Simple? Since it's been working, I was considering to just uh, week it up for another month, but maybe just trying to add a little cardio and tighten up the diet. Well, I would <clears throat> I would take some time off of Mass Made Simple just to allow the body to kind of reset. Um, but I want to I want to talk to you. I want to get on something a little bit specific here right in a second. But if you're going to repeat Mass Made Simple back to back. Um, I think, I think a lot of people have done it with one week, but I think you want to try two weeks. Um, in that two weeks, certainly I would go for as many walks as you can. Uh, I would do full body weightlifting three days a week. Um, kind of a, if you go to like an Arnold's big six program, which was, um, um, uh, squat. If I get it wrong, I apologize. Squat, pull up, row, bench press curl, I think sit up or something like that, but just something very basic, very simple, um, just for a couple of weeks and then go back into it. Now, and this is just an idea. We tried this, David, as an experiment a few t years ago and it failed with me, but that's because it is, it's called lean made simple and you do the mass made simple workouts but you don't do any of the extra meals. Um, so the complexes and the squats become the cardio hit. Um, instead of you know shoveling down food every minute of the day, uh, you lean out. Now the mistake I made on this is I tried to do it. <clears throat> this was this there was some brilliance to it, but I'm an idiot. So I was doing a protein shake for breakfast, two protein shakes midday. And then a, a reasonable dinner of like, you know, uh, a reasonable amount of, uh, of protein and then uh, lots of vegetables, uh, a real big, full mixed vegetable salad, uh, occasionally a, a vegetable based soup and then just, you know, basic vegetables, vegetable, 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 um, just for the health benefits of, of the vegetables. And, and I also tried to do mass made simple. So, uh, we called that lean made simple and I failed on it. And I think because, um, it was, 
I still think I, it was something to do with the protein shakes. I don't know if I wasn't using, using the quality of protein I, I wanted to, or maybe it was just too hard for me to do. But David, that's something you might want to think about. Uh, it'd be interesting to get what, how you, you you have your body fat so accurate. I, would, I wouldn't mind knowing what system you used, but I can guarantee if you do the six-week lean made simple, I'm not telling you to do the, the three-protein shake uh, idea, though this is something Mark Halpern told me about halfway through I should have done. He thought I should have done protein shake, brunch, protein shake, dinner. He thought that might have been a, be a better idea. So that might be something you want to look at uh, and, and just stick with the program if you can. And uh, let us know how it goes. All right. Thank you. I've got an email from Rashid. I'm starting to train with easy strength on the basic movements. I'm 48, 5 to, uh, 5'9", about 172. My current weight has been good for AAU martial arts. Speed and flexibility are keys. Now my goal is to work up from scratch for AAU powerlifting. Today I saw a height weight chart that suggests I should compete at the 220 pound class. At 5'9", yeah, you would, yeah, that's where you'd want to be. This is Boroshenko's advice. The gist seems to be most strong lifters at my current weight have a mechanical advantage, they're shorter, whereas I could gain that advantage if I got stronger and stay lean in a bigger class. Well, 172 to 220 is difference. So I want to ask you, and I'm just going to, before I scroll down, I'm reading your weight at your age as 48. What should I study to understand this as a long-term goal? At 48, you got to really ask yourself a big question. Why do you want to put on that weight? I, mean, I got nothing against it. If it's your goal, go for it. But, um, you know, you're looking at putting on, you know, right there. It's, at 48, you're going to put on 48 pounds. Um, 48 pounds of lean body mass, you'll be Mr. Universe. Um, 48 pounds of chub, and you'll just be another um, person who's going to be emailing me advice about uh, uh, fat loss. It's it's a diff. I can't, Rashid. I can't really say too much here because you're you know you're asking yourself to do something now. If you were 18, I'd be like, yeah, man, right on, yeah. But at 48, you know, you you need to think about your longevity a little bit. And that increased body mass is going to have an impact on it. Having said that, if this is your goal, um, get, you know, get going. I, I don't see easy strength as a very good idea for powerlifting. I, I think it works. I don't think there's a question about it. But I think you need to get involved with powerlifting. Uh, Marty Gallagher, go talk to the West Side guys. Um, get involved in the sport of powerlifting. Now, as you get involved, of course, your your body weight, you know, once you start pulling and, you know, heavy and squatting heavy and benching heavy, your body mass is going to go up. But going up to 220, that's that's a long ways. Um, he, also, too, we're talking about what elite performers do, and you're, ma you're going to be a master lifter. So, you know, you're going to have to be you know, you're going to have to be pulling over six, if not over seven, and you're going to have to be squatting over six, if not over seven. Uh, you gotta, you're got you going to have to have a, a 400 bench easy. So, you know, you've got, you've got quite a road ahead of you. Um, real easy, real easy place to start. Uh, if you have Netflix, and I just, I just made fun of it, but uh, West Side versus the World is a nice little one to watch. And then, of course, I would read everything Marty Gallagher has ever written. I think his book, Purposeful Primitive, is one of the finest books in our field ever. So I hope that helped you, okay? Amanda writes us, I know you're not a doctor, because I constantly say I don't give medical advice. And this question is a bit medically based. So could you elaborate on what type of blood work you get done, and what are you looking for? Oh, huh. yeah, okay. I get blood work done a couple of times a year. Don't forget, I also donate blood uh, three times a year. In fact, I better double check. I might be, I might even go in today. Uh, I do a thing called double red or power red is sometimes called where I donate two whole units of blood and then they give me my plasma back. 
so they just basically have all the hard stuff, all the red blood cells, the white blood cells. And you can only do that three times a year. Um, so they also do a lot of blood tests when you do that. I go in for obviously for my annual physical and I get the whole uh, Dr. Brunetti profile. That's all your cholesterols, your A1C. That's the that's the double check if you're a diabetic or not, and I'm absolutely not. But I also pay a few times a year to get uh, my hormones looked at, and um, and I do it after my exper before and after some experiments I do. Probably the most interesting experiment I've done this year, Amanda, is uh, I had my testosterone levels checked. And then I did a fast mimicking diet because it said that on a fast mimicking diet, your testosterone goes up. Well, my testosterone went through the roof after five days on it, which makes me go, hmm, that works pretty good. Um, yeah, I do. I do this. So, I, and I also get a few other blood tests done there too. Uh, at the age I'm at, I worry a little bit about uh, uh, certain male issues uh, with uh, – the prostate and stuff. And of course, this year I got the opportunity to give a colonoscopy, which is another wonderful little thing. But so I'm a big believer in going through as much as you can. Do you request, request certain tests for your doctor when you go in for blood work? Yes. Yes, I do. And I, and I asked for testosterone. Dr. Brunetti doesn't always let me do that. So that's why I go to another place and get it done and I pay for it. Do you request certain tests? Yes. Also, you mentioned briefly about donating blood because your body is rusting. All right. This comes from uh, Dan and Mary Eads' book, E-A-D-E-S, Protein Power Lifespan Program. And in that book, they note that uh, our bodies have been at war with parasites for a long time. And so what the body and the parasites want to get certain things. And so our bodies become very good about hiding iron from them. And the problem with hiding iron is that iron begins to build up in the bloodstream. Okay. And it's called hematocrit. And I've noticed in my own life, when my hematocrit levels sneak around. Now, this is the older test. Uh, the, the, the new test, you divide all these numbers by three. But in the older numbers, which I'm much more familiar with because I've been given blood since 1976, uh, was when my number started up to 48, 49, I felt sluggish. Now, it's hard to explain that. One time I went in my, and they were at 51, which, I mean, that's what those long distance bike racers, that's where they take that one drug to knock that number up there. After I give blood, I'm back down to 43, 42. And I feel like my blood flows better. So an interesting thing, and this is where the research comes I always love it where the research comes from, is that they had noticed that men and women, women rarely get heart attacks until after menopause. And the re one researcher stopped, stopped and said, well, what's the difference here? Well, of course, it's menses. And so they began to think that whether this is true or not, I just know in my case it's true, is that because of menses, uh, you're constantly, you know, losing iron. And by donating blood, I'm getting that iron taken out of me. Um, it is interesting to think that the that it is a condition, and some people actually have it, where their hematocrit levels are too high, and it is a, and it can be an issue in the in the realm of heart problems. So that's why I do it. I'm curious to learn about, about that and how you came to that realization. Answered it. Again, I know you're not a doctor, but you have great health and fitness common sense for a regular Joe. And in your opinion, which of your books are best for daily life habits and wellness? I have some of your books, and I want to make sure I have the ones with the best life knowledge. Um, yeah, it'd be that three-part. You might not know it's three parts, but it's intervention, can you go, now what? Those are the ones that um, I would use. Uh, in fact, there are colleges that use those as textbooks uh, in their uh, in their coursework. Um, uh, and if you use my textbooks in a college class, I will come in and Skype to your class at least one time, which is always fun. But those are the three. And then I think I think my best book is 40 Years with the Whistle 
but that's not what the market thinks. So there you go. All right. Thank you. We have a question from Julian. We met at Perform Better a couple years ago. I train mostly endurance athletes, and we talked about the 40-day program and how I used a Turkish getup instead of the bench press. Your advice was to keep reps two or three every day and go five, and this is the Turkish getup, so two reps left, two reps right, and go five once or twice in a month. Program worked awesome in tandem with FMS corrective work as I ran a marathon later last year. Yeah, good. In reading, in doing my reading of some of your articles, I wanted to test out your even easier strength program on myself before I implement it with my clients. As a cyclist mainly, and as a runner and triathlete, triathlete secondarily, I am, I'm wanting to test that out for two months per your recommendation. And after that, I want to do the beginner Olympic lifting program as I love the Olympic lifts personally. <clears throat> Long term, I'm thinking about going back to easy, easier strength for another two months and then do the big 21 Olympic for a month. Again, personally, I love the old lifts. So a six month split, if you will. Okay, that's there's a lot of there's a lot of balls in the air, but I think it'll work when you do it. Questions are one, I watch my diet good enough. And adding the fact that I ride, run, and swim regularly, should I be concerned about weight gain? I'm actually trying to lose weight. Uh, that's That happens in the kitchen, man. Uh, weight loss happens in the kitchen. Um, if you're trying to lose weight and you ride, run, and swim, and you do all this lifting, uh, your issue is in the kitchen. Um, um, there's, there's a lot of good books on there, but basically... Be sure you shop intelligently, come home, prepare the food, you know, cut the vegetables, cook the meats, prepare your meals, and do and eat the meals you prepare. So yeah, you 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 shouldn't be too concerned about lifting weights, especially when you do the Olympic lifts. That's I mean, I, yeah, it, it's it's exhausting. Two, would you recommend I keep the pressing movements as listed? I know you hate people making changes to your programs. I don't hate it. Just that people come in and change all the programs and then ask me why it's not working. And I'll say, well, did you do the program? No, I did my variation. Well, I, you have to fix it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I digress. But as I train a few clients via the distance training online, as I train a few clients via the distance training online, and I'm sure if I start implementing a version of this program, even easier strength, they'll push back on bench. Um, well, you don't need to bench. I only recommend the vertical stuff mostly. Uh, in my experience, uh, the only bench I've ever done on easy strength is the incline bench. Um, I don't. I don't know where you're seeing bench press so much in my work, but really, the it's mostly just the vertical, the military or overhead press family. Um, what changes, if any, would you recommend for me and my endurance athletes for even easier strength? Uh, yeah, I would not. I would stick with that option where you don't change exercises at all for the 40 days. Don't, don't change them at all. Um, press, press, pull up, deadlift, ab wheel, loaded carries. That's it. Don't change the thing. Don't get cute. And finally, do you think either or both Olympic programs would neg negatively affect my cycling or run running season? Well, there's going to be some soreness, but I think you'll run the soreness out within the first uh, couple thousand strides. You should be back to normal. Um, yeah, soreness is always an issue. That's why you want to do, and I, I think Olympic lifting is a great thing for distance runners and sprinters, but not in season. It's a great off and early preseason uh, adaption. A lot of questions there, and thank you very much. And with Julian's multiple questions we come at the end of our questions for this week um there was a nice mix of things um and uh, i do my best to answer the questions um sometimes there's there's a bit of a struggle when i when i try to answer the questions because if we were in a dialogue i could push or prod you or get a little bit of more information here and make things just a little clear but 
I'm always here to answer questions anytime I can, um, and I'm honored to do it. Uh, again, if you have questions, send your questions to podcasts at danjohnworkouts.com, and we'll be here next week to answer them for you. Thank you.